Welcome back to Going Bush. Now, Andrew Carbon, you and I, this forest, we're all literally made of the stuff. And at no point in history has carbon had a higher profile than now. That's right, Nick, but there's still lots and lots to learn. And that's why scientists from around Australia and indeed the world are setting up their labs in the forest with state-of-the-art measuring equipment. In this case, our carbon classroom is Wombat State Forest, 50 k's west of Melbourne and recently home to the University of Melbourne's shiny new flux tower. But what is a flux tower, I hear you ask? Yeah, a flux tower is an instrument that you can place in any ecosystem and it measures the exchange of carbon dioxide, water and energy between that ecosystem and the atmosphere. So in effect it measures the amount of carbon and water that comes in and goes out of any ecosystem. So sitting above the forest canopy, the flux tower silently measures in minute detail the carbon transaction of the growing trees and that's giving us an accurate picture of photosynthesis and respiration. But there's more to the forest carbon story. And Stefan, it's not just the uh, carbon exchange happening 30 metres off the forest floor that you're looking at, right down here on the ground it's happening as well? Yes, uh, this is instrumentation that we use to measure the exchange of carbon and other greenhouse gases from the soil so that we get an understanding of the contribution of soil-based emissions to the overall exchange of the forest. Before all this whiz-bang technology, about the only method of knowing how much carbon a forest was consuming and storing was by measuring its trees. That's still done, but again, it's now with a high-tech edge. Yeah, this instrument here, for example, measures... Uh, with very high accuracy the uh, growth of a tree. Uh, again, we measure uh, tenth of a millimetre increments. All these data streams are collected and collated in the on-site lab and every week or so uploaded to Melbourne Uni. It's this information that will guide future carbon mitigation and management strategies. What we're really trying to do here is use the data and calibrate and validate so-called process-based models that will tell us um, how much carbon a forest will take up and how much carbon the forest will, will lose. The forest monitoring equipment is also valuable in helping to predict the carbon outcomes of major disturbance events. When we're talking major disturbances within a forest, we're talking fire, we're talking harvesting, but there's a whole heap more than that. It certainly is. There's a potential for a change in the climate, and yes. that's what this convoluted apparatus behind us is trying to replicate. A 40% decrease in the amount of rainfall yep. falling on this particular forest, and what that does to the carbon exchange. In Victoria, flood, drought and large bushfires have all been major players over the past decade. At the moment, we have uh, very limited information or no information of what a bushfire will really do to the amount of carbon that's stored in a forest. In Victoria in the last 10 years, about one third of all the ecosystems, forest ecosystems, have been burned by catastrophic natural bushfires. Um, and at present, we don't really know how much that impacted on the carbon cycle of a forest system. So we know that forests absorb carbon when they grow and emit carbon when they die or burn. Forestry Tasmania's senior research scientist in forest carbon, Martin Moroni, wants us to change the way we think about the carbon stored in our forests. When I think of forests, I think of an analogy like a dam where we've got uh, carbon coming in through photosynthesis and carbon going out through wildfires or through decomposition following tree death. But the amount of carbon we can store in the landscape is limited. Even with popular carbon offset schemes planting trees on our behalf, the numbers required to absorb the carbon from one year's worth of fossil fuel burning are staggering. In 2004 the IPCC estimated that it was 7.5 gigatons of carbon. To absorb that into wood we'd have to produce enough wood to produce a 30 kilometre cube of wood or enough wood to make a 2x4 that wraps around the earth at the equator over 250,000 times or if we had a established plantations that grew at 10 metres of wood per hectare per year we'd need a plantation estate four times the size of Australia or four times the size of continental USA. So forest carbon storage is important but it isn't the only role for forests and timber products to play in our increasingly carbon aware world. But the other which is probably more potentially important is managing our native forests because by managing them for the supply of wood products those wood products replace energy and carbon intensive materials like steel, aluminium, cement but not only that it ties that carbon up in that product for its lifetime and when that lifetime is over 
it can actually be used to substitute for other fossil fuel energy forms. So in the carbon world, wood is good, particularly as a replacement for energy hungry products like steel, aluminium and concrete. Carbon stored in forests doesn't stay there indefinitely, it's more like a temporary holding place, a carbon dam. And the Wombat Forest Flux Tower and 20 others like it around the country are helping us better understand the carbon exchange. Some interesting findings from the Flux Tower there, Nick. Mm. Now, stick around because after the break, we ask the question, which is better, native or plantation forestry? And still to come in the program, how you can gauge the health of a forest yes. by looking at the water.